Thanks for coming out. And we'll have wine afterwards, so hang around and feast your... Oh, pizza too, right? Yeah. Okay, the B. It was 78 degrees on a windy afternoon in mid-September. I was sitting in my backyard and sipping on some homemade plum vodka from an 8-ounce jam jar. It was heavenly, really. When I felt a lump in my mouth and spat it out, it was a bee, and it just lay there in the grass a few seconds, then stumbled out of its stupor and walked off. That, that's happened to you before? I'd almost swallowed it. I looked over my yard toward my fenced-in garden, showing off its peas, strawberry plants, white dwarf pumpkins like newborn baby heads, spinach, and the tall stalks of dead garlic. I began to, to wish the bee had been someone I could open a beer for and chat with about its day, its nectar yield, and what it was like to land in my cold drink and almost drown in its plummy sweetness. Premeditated lazy. It's mid-July, hot and muggy. I may take the day off and sit in my backyard with my new pipe tobacco and watch squirrels listen for them in the branches above me, catch glimpses of chipmunks in the grass, observe the garlic growing. The other day, a doe walked into the yard. We had a nice quiet stare down before she hightailed it. Today, my smoke might warn her off, but I won't miss her. I've got that memory, my pipe, the squirrels, chipmunks, garlic, the sunshine, and the shady trees and I don't own a hammock, but I might shop for one today, or not. Summer. Yeah, so I was obsessed with uh, the relationship between rationalism and technocracy for a while, and what poetry had to do with it all for a while, so this poem kind of came from that. And then... Uh, and then I'll end with, uh, can't get out of here without a baseball poem, right? So, this is called Ghosts. To ask what a counter-rationalist poetry would look like or sound like may be like asking what it's like to live underwater or to bathe while floating in outer space or to be dead. Amusing to imagine, but difficult to experience, precisely because it's beyond our experience. And as empiricism tells us, experience is our own only teacher. I suppose we might see ourselves as ghosts haunting the technocratic world in it, but not of it. Making our little haunting sounds, but only vaguely heard by the living, if heard at all. Certainly not seen. Sometimes wondered about, maybe, like children wondering about the center of the earth or what's beyond the sky or later in their lives, the known universe. And sometimes sitting alone and listening to the sunlight fall like rain on a perfect afternoon in April, I wonder if what it is I perceive as poison is what has always been poison, which means it has always been sunlight or rain, pure as a golden little giggle from a three-year-old child who hasn't known yet what empiricism is or what might grow in her brain someday to be sadness and distance and pain, or to be the fear of being left by the one thing she doesn't know yet is all she ever wanted, that is, someone to sing la 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 in her ear, quietly and without shame or remorse, with one hand stroking her hair and the other the inside of her arm. Just don't speak, she says, then stands up from her crib, grows up, and floats around like the rest of us, bent over from the weight of her dead bones and from the sounds that had accumulated in her head for years. Just don't speak, she tries to say again years later. But the words only come out in muted colors, like in clouds over a stormy ocean, so far off to the south that it makes her want to be there and not here on a white sandy beach where she stands with her father or her lover or both. Or maybe the words come out in the smells of a breakfast cooking over an outdoor fire, bacon perhaps, perhaps just eggs with toast a little burnt on one side, but with butter and peach jam she won't taste the poison. 
Or maybe the words come out in the way gravel felt on her bare feet in the summer as she was trying to cross the road to get to the pond her mother told her to stay away from because she wasn't a good swimmer. It's all in the way you ask the question, her mother used to tell her, and in the tone of your voice just before you pass away into Candyland. That's when it will dawn on her that though losing everything isn't all it's been cracked up to be, it's all we ever had. Well, that was a shift in tone, wasn't it? Sorry, Sorry about that. All right, a little lighter here. The last out. I heard later the Yankees blew it in the bottom of the ninth. In the top of the inning, one of the Royals had hit a homer off Rivera. That tells you when this was, right, you Yankee, you Yankee fans out there. To make it 3-2, and then with bases loaded, Cabrera bounced out first. I'd seen most of the game, saw A-Rod's homer in the bottom of the eighth that tied it up. But my wife and I had to get to the park before it got too dark to grill all the vegetables and cool ourselves in the breezes off the water and to enjoy the last of the purple clouds. This is Stewart Park I'm talking about. While we watched the sunset, I reminisced about this park 25 years ago, how I'd written a poem about it in which I used the word promontory, even though the park has no promontory to speak of, because I thought the sound of the word evoked the image of the willows hanging their green growth down against the sky's dying light. I told her I used to think words could do that, reify nature's beauty, but that I'm glad words in my mind have been unburdened of that gravitas. She was turning the vegetables, eggplants whole and cut up, zucchini and onions, red and green peppers, and I was watching the dog. I talked about my former vision of success, how if you paid attention to the details, good things will happen. Yeah, she said, I used to think that too. A response that pleased me, and yet for a moment I had a yearning that the vision be true again, and that her existence in my life be its proof that my devotion and our love were the details well attended to. When they replayed the game the next day, there I was again. A-Rod had hit the homer, tied again. Rivera came out and gave up that home run. Bottom of the ninth, A-Rod on base, Giambi walks, bases loaded with two outs, and Cabrera up with the tying run on third. Then came a storm alert. And by the time the TV came back on, the players were walking off the field. I have two poems. This is a poem called Vanities. And I wrote this when I was reading uh, Mahmoud Darvish. And, um, and it was making me feel expansive, um, though this is not how he writes, right? Vanities, it has an epigraph um, from his book, Eleven Planets. Vanity, vanity of vanities, everything on the earth is vanishing. We eat of food and its unseen worlds, biota for the body, microbes for the brain. The body as host, the body as life-giving universe. I inhale Cleopatra, you Exhale, California drought. Strawberries, almonds, kale. We push our shopping cart through microclimates of disbelief. Allow the cashier to appropriate our debt. I want the reddest, baddest, sweetest pepper, the one from stolen land and water. You want the foreground con conclusion the whipped and uncertain cream. Carbon creates life, oxygen creates minerals, the dead create carbon. Here we are praising individuality when what the soul craves is connection. Angels lonely for bodies to inhabit. She puts her hand on your knee and the world goes black. He rests his head on your lap and you both dream of summer. Beyond this fragile orbit, beyond this infinite blue, darkness is the creator 
of stars. How did we find one another? And my second poem, keeping with the food theme <laughs> for this, is a poem I've been reading of resistance. The title is Poem for the TSA Officers Who Rifled Our Bags to Dump Homemade Jam We Were Carrying as Gifts. True story. I think that's all I have to say. Poem for the TSA officers who rifled our bags to dump homemade jam we were carrying as gifts. You never can tell what those peaches were doing naked together in that Guatemalan basket. Or how the moon whispered to an underground of resurgent garlic, winters when you thought the living world asleep. Beware the last red peppers of autumn, how they fatten into gorgeous fists raised in, at dawn in solidarity. Trust not the pickled relish. Keep an eye on those candied beets. Know that bees are amassing in goldenrod, hoping to keep their queen alive as battalions of crickets play violin in the tall and anonymous grass. Trust not the sweat-sticky kitchen, uprising of steam as grapes royal in a delirium of kettle-shaking goodness. Keep an eye on the elder who ladles, ladles the whole sweet mess into a bell choir of singing jars each ping rousing unexplainable delight. Know that in kitchens throughout this land, such sweetness is gathering daily. Here's to jam making and gardening and Ithaca summers and getting through TSA. I'm going to read two poems. One is old, one is new, and I think you can say that they're both borrowed in blue because they both deal with honeymoons. Um, the first one, this is, it's a true story, and it's about, it's about travel. They're both also about travel. This is a trip that I didn't go on, a trip to New York, but somehow I did go on the trip. They will see Rita Hayworth in Central Park, wartime, and Angie's pregnant. Last chance for that honeymoon they should have taken years earlier. The ship moves through the sound, glides down the East River, rounds the battery, and they slip unnoticed through Times Square, St. Patrick's Cathedral, the Automat. Rockefeller Center's skaters trace infinity and European theaters are far away. In Central Park, a woman poses with a soldier, a sailor, a marine. She clicks her bright, bored smile off and on, wreathed by ears and grins. Hey, says the photographer, hey you, we need a civilian. No thanks, he walks away, muttering to Angie. Who the hell was that woman, anyway? Next day, her pictures in the paper, marching with the nation. The three servicemen are joined by another civilian. Not half so good looking, he thinks, hmph, he thinks, while Angie appropriates a bar or two of Dixie hotel soap to keep as a souvenir. Now the second poem is um, really about Niagara Falls. Um, and I was working on, on this poem, and I had never been to Niagara Falls, and I watched a lot of YouTube videos. And every summer, my husband and I have, we like to take little trips for our anniversary, and usually, because they are little trips, we go someplace in upstate New York, and we thought, let's go to Niagara Falls. Neither of us had been there. Um, 
So it, it, it's, really, it's really magnificent. Um, the, the poem is, has three parts. It, it's, there are three, I guess you could call them characters. Theo refers to Theodosia Burr, who was the daughter of Aaron Burr. Um, and in fact, in the musical Hamilton, there's a song in which Aaron Burr is, is writing to his daughter right before the famous duel. Um, the, the second character is Gregory Corso, who, um, who wrote a poem called Marriage that involves Niagara Falls. And the third one is the Maid of the Mist, uh, referring to a Native American legend. Um, and I'm sure everybody's heard the legend. And, um, and, and I got a little carried away with epigraphs. There are three epigraphs. Theo Gregory and the Maid of the Mist. In 1801, Theodosia married Joseph Alston. They spent their honeymoon in Niagara Falls, beginning an American tradition. Susan Osmore, The Mysterious Disappearance of Theodosia Burr. They were the first honeymooners at Niagara Falls. Oh, I'd live in Niagara forever in a dark cave beneath the falls, Gregory Corso. There are black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads, full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder, Jonathan Edwards. Theo, hey, take a look at that, he said, and she heard it first, the emptying of the world into itself, the roar of the machine of perpetual displacement, and when she dared to look, all she saw was curtains, yards of them, layers of promiscuous shears, scooped in armfuls, falling from a bowed crest, an opaque rush, a sheer drop, a plum capitulation and a mist, the mystery of it all. She was still a bride, and what she saw was noise made white and shifting shape. Did it pertain, portend? Why did she shiver? Why was he oblivious? Gregory. Everyone knew everything that would happen in all those rooms where suitcases sprung open revealed new nightgowns trimmed with lace and ribbon rosebuds. The roses on the wallpaper gave off the scent of eau de funeral parlor. Although the hat boxes were bright and tight and everyone wore clean underwear. The girl was born with the letters of the Greek alphabet embroidered on her bib. A vestal lady in her father's house, she rode her horse hard across the woods of Greenwich Village. Everyone knew her as a fierce girl who attacked the natural sciences with the knife and fork of hunger. For fun, she conjugated verbs in ancient languages, arranging them with long-stemmed adjectives in tall, slim vases. Her new husband owned rice plantations and the first few grains of a gubernatorial dream. He had the moolah. But daddy -o, who everyone knew, played fast and loose, pulled a lot of strings. Theo and Joe may not have had the hots for each other, but they had the warms. Should have named the boy after his father. Should have drawn the curtains. The maid. All she saw was curtains. It was curtains for her. All I saw was curtains. It was curtains for me curtains drawn tight against the darkness. I was not afraid. I was the chosen one. I was the light. I did not see the darkness. After the dancers danced, they filled my canoe. My canoe runneth over. With sunflowers, squash, and corn, they filled my canoe. My canoe runneth over. They pushed me toward the rush of great waters, and I was caught and carried by great waters rushing to be let loose, and I was brave. About the honeymoons, I think the brides come here to die. I see them in their shrouds, displayed like dolls, one on every bedspread, dying their little deaths, and they are brave. So brave and fierce to start new lives, they leave their names behind, they leave their selves behind. 
When it happened, everyone said sins of the father. Everyone knew about her father. I had a father too. Our fathers loved us. Love is a leaf that wafts above the stream. Love is a leaf swallowed by great waters. They see her ghost along the outer banks. They see her on Cape Hatteras in Nag's head. They see her riding water spouts. Of course they see her. Where else would she go? She's dead. Her ship, the Patriot, left Georgetown, shadowed by black clouds big with thunder. At least that's how Theo's famous great-grandfather would have put it. He was big on fire and brimstone. But I think I know enough of the philosophy of Starnes to cast no blame. Everyone says they see me in the mist. Of course they see me. Where else would I go? I'm dead. When I try to walk the rainbow, I learn that red is slippery, violet is slick. They come giddy in their loud blue hoods. They come giddy with cameras and iPhones and GoPros. The world has changed. They come in boats named after me to find me. I am there, crouching behind the curtains. They see me, but leave without a photograph. I am not photogenic. I am just a smudge in the mist in an image hidden in the cloud. I am dead. I would rather have been a dancer. Thank you. Dinner time at the border. The guards were armed with AKs. One put his head through the car window. I gave him my documents. We cannot let you into Ghana. You do not have the proper stamp on your passport, the soldier said. I guess this is goodbye, I muttered to Edward, my British acquaintance. I should have stayed in Abidjan. I was teaching in the Ivory Coast at the time. What will you do, asked Edward. I'll hitchhike back to Boisquet, I said, prepared to rely on luck to make the journey on my own. A few hours later, sun setting, I heard rustling noises in the multicolored roadside foliage. I wasn't sure what animals were indigenous to this terrain, but clearly I wasn't one of them. So, as you can see, I made it through unscathed, <laughs> but it was a little scary uh, for a while. It's another poem, I'll spare you the details. So this is called The Cliff, and it's about climbing up a cliff without a rope or any other uh, support mechanism. Straight up, 90 degrees, gray slate, found small open space, stuck four of my fingers inside a hole, began to climb, find indentations where I could put two fingers inside deep enough to get leverage, and pull myself up a few inches, which became feet, then became yards, scraping arms and chest, soaking t-shirt, fighting dizziness, but can't look down because your friends can't help you anymore. So that was a very scary situation because I, I had no way down. I mean, except falling, so I had to make it to the top. Okay, so this one is called Don't Ask Me. and. The story behind this title is partly surreal, uh, bizarre. Uh, this young man did a shooting rampage on my college campus. I mean, he, I'll go into that in, a little in the poem, but uh, there was a radio bulletin from our college station, uh, KCRW. So, saying active shooter on campus. So one of the employees at the radio station, which was based in the liberal arts building, didn't know what to do or how to, how to proceed. So he walked out into the hallway. And down the hallway comes this young man with uh, combat boots, black jeans tucked into the boots, black t-shirt, and the AR-15. The employee says, there's an announcement about an active shooter. Thinking this guy was a SWAT team guy, what do I do? Where do I go? 
And Johnny said, don't ask me. I mean, the guy is still alive today because of this bizarre sense of humor, I think. In any case, a warm day in June, so Jeremiah went outside for lunch. He sat on a slope across from his old lit classroom, opened the container of salad he bought. He put a small tomato in his mouth and saw Johnny Zahn lying on the ground, wearing his black cargo pants tucked into his combat boots and bloody vest and black t-shirt, looking as he did that day when he got shot and placed on the grass by SWAT officers who then returned to the library to look for accomplices. They only found crying students and shaken staff members. A woman from my class told us Johnny had fired many AR-15 rounds at the books on the shelves. Nobody had known that John Zahn killed his father and older brother prior to coming to campus, where he gunned down a student, a groundskeeper, and a woman who collected bottles and cans to help the homeless. Why do you do it, Johnny? Don't know, he said, staring skyward. My father beat my mom. My brother bullied me. I was full of anger and hate. Wish I didn't learn to build that gun. A siren screamed as an ambulance went by. Time to get back to hell, he said. So it's kind of like a recurring vision because once you see a body lying on the grass near your favorite workplace, I mean my favorite classroom, it kind of sticks with you. It's not constant. It just bounces back from time to time. And this Jeremiah, in this case, is me. I just changed the name to protect the guilty or innocent. But thank you very much for your attention. I have a new collection I've been working on for the last 17 years. This one took 15 years to publish, and so I'm, I'm in the 17th year of the second. Uh, and it's entitled My Father's Gun, and it's in three parts. The first is uh, Black Lives. It has to do with growing up in Baltimore. Uh, the second is My Father's Gun. My father owns uh, a gun, which is very disturbing to me, so that sparked a bunch of poems and around the theme of he has no business having one. And um, the third part is called Shotgun, and I'll read from that. Uh, just a, These are three poems. I'll, I'll read three poems about my mother. Everyone will be happy about that. My, I lost my mom in... Uh, January, and I'm finding that writing about it through poetry has really been helpful. And then one, since Corey inspired me to do a do a baseball, a short baseball poem at the end. So the first, uh, my mom was a poet and attorney, uh, very much battler for children's rights as a family law attorney. And this is called uh, Joyride, 1962. You gunned the engine, touching 100 miles an hour down Ocean Highway in your royal blue 58 Thunderbird, while your friends creamed with excitement and popped a cork in the back seat, telling you not to sweat being late, that the rhythm method odds were in your favor because it was your first time, unable to breathe when the test came back and your life skidded, stopped in a used car lot, where my grandfather had taken your prized possession, embarrassed to meet a friend who wrestled away your T-bird for a song and you, still in shock, starting to show. The empty magnum rolled across the floorboards like a disabled cannon, where you sat watching the cold smoke of their voices discuss your wedding and delivery day, wondering if you could have gone through with it. A decision made over endless cups of coffee in an all-night diner that would have spared me a lifetime of blame for losing the car. And I was fortunate enough to go uh, and be with my mom for really the last four four days where she was lucid uh, in Italy. She had uh, renovated a villa in Italy after she retired from, from being an attorney. And uh, being able to show up and do that was one of the great highlights of my life. Uh, mother exiting. My last photo of you gazing upward, fear in your eyes, while ruby beads from a transfusion drip slowly. Fleeting grains in an hourglass round balls of buckshot into my heart. No food, no water, no bags of blood. A few days later, niente. On your deathbed, life pouring out of you in a 19th century novel with your boys gathered around the headboard and you, as always, worried about who was going to feed us. 
Why do roses die? Lying in state all day against your will, an ancient Italian law to ensure that ruin is formal. I will never forget how beautifully you looked there, like an Apache priestess sacrificed to the gods. The lightness of you, somewhere above this open casket, moving on, and the stillness of hands I will never hold again. Man, one of my um, favorite rides is to drive to Rochester and back. I don't know why, it's, I like it better than driving to Syracuse. It's a beautiful ride. And this, uh, this is sort of in between the beginning, which was Joy Ride, and then the last poem, and then this is kind of in, in, in the sequence in between all of those things happening. Three poems of departure on Route 96. One, snapdragon season, oxblood sky, withering stalks, speeding to catch Joan Baez at the state and hear her sing the night they drove old Dixie down because it reminded me of you driving a rusted out maroon Corvair when the song came on WCAO, me in the backseat playing barrel full of monkeys. They never should have taken the very best. Suddenly a doe to my left bursting headlong across the field like a greyhound, hooves aloft, hell bent for the Prius in front of me. Glancing off the bumper, it soared 30 feet high over my car in a perfect arc, rippling to the ground. Two, passing interlaking, Martin Luther King Day, low visibility, you on my mind the whole way, rehashing the lines from your letter, the only business marked open with a red and white and blue banner unfurling in a squall at dusk and a spotlight fixed on the sign, guns and ammo. You made framed collages of Dr. King, one with drops of blood from his head. I stared at them for hours as a boy. You marched out of the hospital, mink coat, nightgown, sunglasses, no underwear, tubes still attached, waving goodbye. Three, white gold sheet at sunset, snow dips rise and dance, ghostly legions crossing the road with torsos and faces. And this is when I know you are dying. And the final one is a quick baseball poem. I'm going to dedicate this to Corey. It's, uh, uh, it's called Old Timer. I'm the hardball left in the backyard since last summer, barely visible, waterlogged from hibernation, ripped at the stitching. Hit hard through dry rotting seasons, thousands of vulnerable rubber bands wait for a warm hand to grip the seams again. I'm the extra ball for batting practice, brown with grass stains. Hard enough to snap wood. Thank you. We've heard the spirit of Archie Ammons around us, <laughs> and this poem is uh, very much in. Uh, he wouldn't have liked it, but it's, <laughs> it's in his spirit. It's called Grain Philosophy of Science. The people who say, most of the data is chaff, likely are not botanists, who in turn know that these nether and enveloping parts of a grass protect and in due time reveal. Still, threshing and winnowing are good techniques to learn to extract the predictive bits. Now, this next poem is uh, from a particular setting, um, and it's good to dedicate things to people who are in our community, who are an asset to it. And the setting is uh, the Penland School of Crafts in Penland, North Carolina, a very special place, and where I was 10 years ago or more. But uh, the person for whom this poem is here is uh, David Kingsbury who some of you may know from Farmer's Market or elsewhere, uh, a potter uh, who has been a real asset to our community in a number of ways. It's called tectonics, the word, just plate motions or something like that. Genesis. Not God or Rabbi Lowe. Today it's just rolled, squeezing a ball of clay 
his small stake in creation. Did they begin this way, two thumbs, hesitant in clay? Yes, for now there is the other, a hole in the holy round. He remembers. He was six, June 1944, five Jews walking out of hiding to the Russian lines, the fertile fields sodden in spring rains, no way through but through the clay. His uncles are leaning on the women. His mother carries him. Take clay. A thing with magic begs to be understood. Kaolin and feldspar, hydrated aluminosilicates layer, like taking up water, platelets sliding past each other, reversible to a point. This lesson may be of use, but who will do the needing? Centrifugal. In the world of seductive tugs out, and not just at the wheel, all you can do is keep plastic, balance, and build by hand the higher shape within. A hand of clay is not the clay hand of a broken idol. It's a woman in Angola reaching out with a can of milk. It's the hand now too moving nervously of a man told his son is missing in Chechnya. Subtractive. So now this wet object is face, faces me, ample evidence of being far out of the Creator's league. But God was into salvage, I recall, and my teacher says there are tools, all those fingers, a grater, a curvy metal disc, and this slip slurry formation is as much a matter of taking off as adding on. My hand. On the pot, remember, oh, how they reached out for yours, hand over hand, one Swedish summer day. Where people were, there are shards. There is clay on my hands. There is clay in my hair. It'll wash off, not the clay in my heart. Thank you. This summer poem was written for a good friend who lost her mother a couple months ago, and uh, her mom was like a second mom to me. And um, in the last conversation that my friend had with her mom, her mom, owing to partly the medical condition she was experiencing, was uh, hallucinating a scene from her childhood. And um, it, she grew up in Argentina. So she described something she was seeing to her daughter, and it, um, I wrote this for my friend. Let us go to Argentina. Let us go to Argentina to see the newborn calves. There are four of them, glistening black. Stand at the fence and just watch them. It is so peaceful. Come to my summer table. I have prepared our meal. The green beans are in season, and there are tomatoes and corn. Let your young friends also have a bit of wine, like when I was your age. I have made a cobbler of plums for our dessert. Remember the time you rubbed oil on my tired feet? I want to say thank you, dear, for placing the blanket on my legs. The garden must do without me, the birthday cards as well. I am fine, and I do not need anything else. Um, two more. This one is called uh, Picnic on the Mountain. Some of you may know uh, one of the characters in this. It's planned, the picnic on the mountain. For lunch, warm prawns, low horsepower resting, the baffles of our exhaust quietly rumble. Amidst the pine timber by the last of the great, great remote lakes, the lento idol of the standby cycle. A distant telephone ringing, the song cycle. It took two weeks to find the mountain, wind roughing the skin of the lake, white kite rising, the breath of a horse that waits on a bridge of timber, for the moment bellows give in to exhaust. Pure water lapped from the exhaust, the maestro drinks is at the end of his cycle. Eyesight spent, he knows our timber. 
The small boy's mother waits on the mountain. Swiss cottage by the fence, a dog and a horse offer a fishing boat, mornings by lakes. For the honeymoon, we motorcycled by lakes, the confection of the early days, immune to exhaust. Epics traded till dawn, cords gone hoarse. The baby pinks of the early life cycle. Gulping sweet sap from the mountain, burning our towering bonfires of timber. The queue forms on a bridge of timber, 10,000 feet above lakes. It is the only way off the mountain, the nagging feeling we can't exhaust. No need for a cycle, no need for a horse. The maestro sleek as a racehorse wrapped in a fisherman's sweater, not timber, took off in his Italian motorcycle headed for the Alps and their lakes. Let loose opera from the exhaust, became the small boy returned to the mountain. The guide horse casts his reflection in lakes, repairs the timber bridge and clears the exhaust to steer the silent cycle to the picnic on the mountain. And then finally, some of you have heard this one, but like a set, set list, I like to close with it. And since it's so hot today, it's a perfect day to read this one. Exit to 10th Street. If you're willing to get lost, you've lost your will to live. Airport parking lots, Swiss Alps, ski hills, Arizona hiking trails. Dad, 80, feigned interest for the map's colored choices. Charged ahead toward cacti, the canyon's purple edges. We were guests and let him be the leader. He kept refusing my offers of water to teach me to swim. He threw me in the water, born youngest of five, born early, the nurses helped me live. It wasn't clear in those days who was the leader. Upon the divorce, we stayed in the woods, got lost on trails, the hunter's cabin was small, yellow fields at all the edges. Hippie years, my parents made their choices. Three hours in the desert, we began to doubt our choices. No hikers, carcasses of cacti, we were almost out of water bottom of a rocky bowl, sun seared from all the edges. Our car's location, useless, a coordinate, not live. Dad doubted the couple approaching on the trail. Everyone compared notes, we were desperate for a leader. The lost pair took off. I decided to be the leader. The parking lot had vanished, there were no other choices. I said, what about that sign we saw buried by the trail, an emergency route out for when there's rising water? dead, demurred, do each task tidily. That's the only way to live. It's not like he could accept the danger at the edges. To parent all those years ago, they scrambled us to the edges. We duked it out, fought over, fo fought over food, each one alone without a leader. The thing was to survive each other, set fields on fire, simply live, make plans of breaking free, devour books, dream up choices. When spring rains came, the creek roared with water. I'd love to run wild, slide down ravines, never thought about a trail. The sign, exit to 10th Street, was buried by the dusty trail. Beyond a hot, tarred road had trailer homes at distant edges. The man in a Jeep who rescued us asked if we needed water, said he was just out of jail. Driving, he became the leader. Dad was silent, wasn't sure about our choices until we heard that boy last month dried out, just couldn't live. Beware poor marked trails and stubborn solo leaders. Best to crest the edges to discover your saving choices. In old age, drink, cross, water, and grip hard your will to live. Thanks everybody for coming to this lovely bookstore. Maybe if you see something uh, from somebody who read today, you might like to buy one of their books or anything in Buffalo Street Books and enjoy your summer. Thanks for coming again.